Hi guys, and welcome to Macro Markets, where we analyze how the macroeconomic news and events impact the crypto space. I'm your host, Marcel Peschman, a veteran, stock market and derivatives trader, analyst at Point Telegraph. Today's show, we start by discussing the interest rates in Argentina. I just love how those hyperinflationary countries give us a broader perspective on money. Argentina to hold interest rate at 97% as raging inflation eases. The South American nation has an annual inflation running at 114%, though the monthly CPI raise slows slightly in May to 7.8%. 7.8% versus the previous month, 114 per year. It is projecting 150% for the full year of 2023. Believe me, that's not the first time we cover this Latin American country, and it probably won't be the last. That is not their first rodeo with a currency devaluation, and it proves that people continue to work and consume somehow, even if their local currency loses its value. Inflation is expected to end the year near 150%, which hammers earning and spending power. Around 4 in 10 Argentines live in poverty, the peso is sliding fast, and the country's foreign currency reserves are nearly depleted. What is the lesson here? What can we extract from those countries that regularly elect socialist rulers? Well, for starters, everyone wants free money. That explains why altcoins and airdrops continue to attract attention, regardless of whatever the majority of investors end up losing money. Wait, what? How can you lose money on airdrops? Simple because the most valuable ones require either a large spending on Ethereum gas fees or require users to take part on DeFi applications or NFT marketplaces, either via staking or trading, but it involves some kind of capital locked up. And of course, the risks associated with that, namely the smart contract bugs, the hacks and etc. You might think that those investors would quickly learn the lesson, but in reality, quite the opposite occurs. Just like the Argentinians tend to forget the mess caused by the socialist governments in the span of 5 to 10 years, so do altcoin traders in 2 years. All it takes is a new marketing gimmick, a new form of promising free money. We've seen the cycle through DeFi governance tokens, free NFT mints, wallet providers like MetaMask, the crypto gaming sector, dog tokens, layer 2 tokens, bridges, followed by NFT marketplaces airdrops, and now the NFT collectibles handing out dividends. It's always the same story of easy money, but in the end, the excessive offer causes its price to plummet. Like there's 10,000 PFP of monkeys out there each, which one is worth $50,000 and they hand out 50,000 dog NFTs for those holders. So the value of the initial property goes down because there's now more people willing to sell it to another person to get those free money from the dog NFTs. So essentially what they're doing is diluting the initial investor by adding the, the new dog NFTs from the original monkey NFTs. So they're not creating new money, they're just diluting the previous investors. That's exactly the same reason why Argentina repeats the same errors over and over. Because the way socialism presented changes. It adapts to the deep desires of every citizen living in a country where very few control almost all of the assets. So what better way, let's say, for Ethereum than to promise free money for holders via staking? Listen, I'm not saying that Ether is a scam or anything like that. I'm just saying that distributing the coins that were taken from the users in the first place won't make anyone rich, especially if 70% of the initial offer was handed to a few brave participants who invested in the ICO. The bottom line is, forget any promise of free money or dividends that doesn't come explicitly from the economic activity. If you don't know where the yield is coming from, most likely you are the yield. 
meaning you're being used. Now, let's move to the topic most loved by economists, the inverted yield curve. U.S. yield curve hits deepest inversion since 1981. The yield curve inverts when shorter-dated treasuries have higher returns than long-term ones. It suggests that while investors expect the interest rates to rise in the near term, they believe that the higher borrowing costs will eventually hurt the economy, forcing the Federal Reserve to later ease the monetary policy. The phenomenon is closely watched by investors as it has preceded past recessions. But there's a big issue here that was not covered by the headlines, but at least the Reuters story, the article, added details later on. The last six recessions took an average 6 to 36 months after the curve inverted. Now, how can a trader use such an indicator if the recession can take up to two or three years to take place? More importantly, by staying out of the market, or even worse, by opening a short position betting on a market crash, how many times is this trader going to be wiped out? because of a market rally. Those that called the recession 12 months back in July 2022 saw the S&P 500 index gain 15%. Plus, if they had parked their cash in a two-year treasury note in July 2022, they would have gotten a mere 3% yield, a 3% return, while the CPI inflation came in at 4%. That's the inflation official from the government. Even gold will have returned 8% in the last 12 months. So those that have been calling for recession are only making a fool of themselves. I'm not saying that the S&P 500 won't eventually plunge 30% from the top or that the US won't face two consecutive quarters totaling three or more GDP contraction. I'm just saying that it is stupid to bet on a crisis while the central bank is adding liquidity and the government has just raised the debt ceiling. The problem is that we are pricing the assets and goods in dollar terms. So the more dollars in circulation, the higher their unitary price is. That's why Bitcoin's hard locked monetary policies are so important. It doesn't matter if the Bitcoin's equivalent inflation is one or 3%, as long as it is predictable and really hard to change requiring consensus. So when you hear someone calling for $100,000 Bitcoin by year end, partially it comes from the devaluation of the US dollar. But the big question is, can they both coexist? Can Bitcoin reach, let's say, $200,000 per unit, meaning a $4 trillion asset class, while the same $440,000 are required to acquire the average home in the United States the answer is a resounding yes. Firstly, it can attract part of the gold's current $12 trillion valuation, even if you set aside $6 trillion, nearly half of it, excluding jewelry, there's still a lot of that money that can flow into Bitcoin. But that's really small if you compare it to the global debt market, the bond market, or real estate. H valued at $300 trillion or more. We've discussed last week what happened to the short-term real estate yields, which plunged 40% or more year over year in some areas. Those renting out on Airbnb, for example, we've also covered how some of the commercial property funds went bankrupt due to work from home and socialist rulers in California. My best guess is investors will want to keep their money in the safest asset classes they know, namely bonds and cash. But as soon as they realize how the government will further issue stimulus measures, the package to advert another crisis, they will have to take risk. And that's why the Bitcoin spot ETF approval is so important and essential for a $200,000 bull run. Well, that's it for today. I hope you guys enjoyed the show. Remember to like and subscribe the new Contelegraph Markets and Research YouTube channel. See you.